Praise God. Matthew chapter 11. And I'll read from verse 11 and verse 12 of Matthew chapter 11. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, among those who are born of women, there is not uh, reason one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. It's greater than, 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 than John the Baptist. said, notwithstanding, okay, uh, I'm, I'm trying to read from my note on the screen at the same time. Okay, let me, uh, can you give me New King James Version on the screen? Yeah, if you can. Okay. So he said, give me verse 12. Verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. One translation says from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing. And it says the, 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 the passionate and the forceful are pressing into it. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Uh, and the forceful have been pressing into it. Pressing into the kingdom with certain measure of forcefulness. Engaging the forces of the kingdom is where I want to start from this morning. You know, it's possible for you to be a believer. I've been a believer now uh, over 30 years of being saved. And I've seen my life evolve from one stage to the other through the engagement of the forces of the kingdom. It's like saying that something exists, you have access to it, but you need some measure of force or passion to engage. Because uh, how do you join a moving train? You know, back in the day in Lagos here, we used to have what they call Molwe. Yeah. When I came to Lagos in 1991 to leave for the first time, that was 31 years ago. There was something that was called Molwe then. It was, it's not uh, so uh, common again now. Let's make welcome, Pastor Yemi. Yeah. When you want to join Molwe, what do you do? Back in the day, the vehicle will be moving. You can't, they don't stop. Am I saying the truth? They don't stop. So what they do is that <laughs> you have to calculate the average moving speed, the acceleration of the motorway. So from where you are standing, you are looking at the vehicle as it's going, and then you start to run, and all of a sudden you reach out. If you reach out and your speed is too much, if you reach out and your speed aligns, you are able to enter easily. But you can't be standing still and join a moving train. When the Bible says here in Matthew 11 and verse 12, since the day of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing <laughs> and it takes the forceful to advance with it. So the violent the forceful are pressing into it. Uh, some people don't understand that the kingdom of God is governed by certain forces. And if you want to press in, if you want to be a part of it, you can't be stagnant and be pressing in. You need some measure. You know, even for Jesus, they said, uh, the zeal of the house of God has consumed him. Zeal there talks about passion. It talks about a force. Something that drives you to be able to press in into something that is moving or forceful. And the Bible says that the kingdom is forcefully advancing and you and I need to press into it. This is where I'm going. Romans 14 and verse 17. The writer of the book of Romans showed us three principal forces that keeps you know, that forceful advancement in place. 
and how you can engage it without missing out in what heaven has to offer you. Romans 14 and 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. There are three principal forces of the kingdom that every believer must seek to lay hold on because without operating in them, it's like you being stagnant wanting to join the moving train. You will miss your train. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, or you're trying to join a moving bus. You will move your, you, 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 you will miss, you know, that, that bus. And many believers are missing the bus. Missing the bus. What God has for us is fullness of joy. Psalm 16 there, verse 11, uh, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness. Fullness of joy and at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. But it's possible to miss that fullness of joy or the pleasures at his right hand. Because some people think it's just automatic. You have to be able to press in. You have to be able to press in. And it says the principal forces with which we're pressing, one is the force of righteousness, Romans uh, 14 and 17. Uh, the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The force of righteousness is the foundational force of the kingdom. Time will not permit me today to teach on it, but when you have the mindset that I've been made righteous, I am, I don't just have, I'm not just righteous. I am the righteousness of God. Yeah. He that is born of the spirit is spirit. And he that is born of the flesh is flesh. My righteousness is not my own. It's a gift given to me. When I receive it, the force of righteousness becomes operational in my life. It's the foundational force of the kingdom. That's what shows that you are part of this kingdom. That the DNA of the kingdom is operational in you. It is the force of righteousness. But you see, it's possible to have the force of righteousness operational and miss out on the rest. Yeah. The force of joy is what opens you up to the fullness of God. Without fullness of joy, you can't have fullness of life. Can I say that one more time? I said, without fullness of joy, you can't have fullness of life. Now, the force of peace is that which protects your joy. Are you still with me today? Righteousness is the foundational force of the kingdom. Peace is the one that guides or that, that, that safeguards what connects you. Joy is what connects you after you have the foundation but you can lose your joy if you don't do well with your peace are you still with me today is somebody following me today from time to time the devil is either after your joy or your peace if you are like the devil you don't waste your time with things that don't matter you know some people think that the devil doesn't have strategy or is mindless. No. There are some things that the devil will never touch in your life. Because if he touch those things, it does not affect your peace or your joy. <laughs> when the devil wants to deal with a believer, what he wants to do is either make you feel, just like the Bible says that uh, 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 there's therefore now no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Said for the law of love uh, in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Is it that the devil is after your righteousness through condemnation and guilt to destroy the foundation? You know what sin makes you feel like? Sin makes you feel worthless before God. Like the feeling of the prodigal son. You know what the prodigal son felt when he came to himself? He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You know, there's some religion in the world that believe that nobody is worthy to be called son of God. All of us are servants of God. I used to be a part of that religion. I don't want to say it. But my parents were born Muslims. And I was a Muslim for the first about 17 years or 16 years of my life. And I was taught 
that nobody qualifies to be called son of God. That all of us are servants of God, slaves of God. Yeah. How do you layer righteousness on that kind of thinking? That you have the DNA of God. If you are just a servant of God, you are not a child of God. Because you have to be a child. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, He that is born of the spirit is spirit. And he that is born of the flesh is flesh. Nicodemus said, no man can do the things that you do except God is with the person. Said Jesus said, it's not just that God is with me. I have him. <laughs> I'm from him. I proceed from him. I'm an offshoot of him. That's the force of righteousness I'm talking about. Yeah. That even when you're struggling with sin, you know that righteousness is an empowering force that will help you to float over and above sin. The force of sin. The force of sin works like the force of gravity. It wants to pull everybody down to the earth. Yeah, that you are earthly, earthly. Anything that you throw, that you throw on the face of the earth, where does it go? Comes down. That's how the force of sin works. It wants to make you as earthly and as limited to this world as possible. But the force of righteousness it's like the force of aerodynamics. It, that's what the plane uses to fly. Yeah. The plane defies gravity and takes off and goes up to demonstrate to us that there are forces in the universe greater than the natural forces that we know. So righteousness causes me to take off. We are seated with Christ. In heavenly places, far and above, like the jumbo jet, far and above. When we take off, we take off. We don't land, we stay there. We don't allow guilt to make us land here. Condemnation cannot make us land here. And I speak freedom over anyone under the, the every load of guilt and condemnation today. I declare that the force of righteousness within you comes to play much more from this season. In the name of Jesus. So when the devil wants to attack your sense of righteousness, it reminds you of where you've been, bad things that you've done, or what you're struggling with. But Jesus is always saying in your heart, by spirit, that you're more than conqueror. You can overcome, you know, this habit. You can overcome this. You can overcome that. And the devil wants you to feel like you're not worthy to be called a child of God and you don't have that force within you and the force is at work within you it's at work within you it's at work the kingdom of God is in righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost when when I allow the force of righteousness to be at play I, I, I'm inadvertently safeguarding my joy I'm safeguarding my joy and the ultimate protection for my joy is my peace are you still here today? Yes, I said, are you still here? Yes, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, when you read from verse 10 down to 14. It says, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. Says the Lord, who has mercy on you? O ye afflicted, who brought the affliction, the devil? To steal your peace so that it can access your joy because you see when when these forces are destroyed or hindered in the life of a believer what starts to happen is that the kingdom starts to elude us in 2022 the kingdom of god will not elude you Amen. yeah the fullness of life in the kingdom of god will be your portion Amen. in the name of the lord jesus christ uh he said oh you afflicted one Tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and uh, lay your foundation with sapphire. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught of the Lord, taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. He said, In righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression. For it shall not, you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. In this passage of the scripture, you see 
Isaiah prophesying about all these forces being in place, righteousness. He said, my covenant of peace, I will not break. He said, I will even protect the peace of your children. And when peace is in place, your joy is protected. Your joy is protected. Your joy is protected. Because, you know, according to Isaiah chapter 12, uh, it's with joy that we draw. It's with joy that we draw out of the wells of salvation. It's, it's with joy that we draw. Yeah. And when your joy is gone, then it's difficult to draw anything. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For, yeah, uh, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, uh, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You will draw water from the wells of salvation. When my joy is gone, there's nothing to draw with. There's nothing to draw with. All the provision may be there. You know, I grew up in Ibadan. I don't know, some people here, you grew up in Lagos, in the Kejau, I don't know you, Jones. You've never seen a well before. Yeah, if I want to say well, you think we're talking about wellness. Because <laughs> you don't know what a well is. If you, if you have, if, have, how many of we have drawn water from the well before? Can I see a show of hands? Oh, you're yeah, my people, my people. We are together. <laughs> in my growing up days, where I grew up in Ibadan, many, many, I mean, sometimes there's no water flowing through the tap. And then we have to go to the well. And there's something like a bucket or bag with a long rope. You have to let it into the well and then you draw out. It's one thing for the well to be full of water. It's another thing for you to have something to draw with. You remember the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Uh, Jesus asked her for water. He said, where will we get water? There's nothing to draw with. Yeah. She was stuck because there was nothing to draw with. Yeah. Uh, she, she couldn't get, uh, you know, a life of God into her marital life because there was nothing to draw with. So she was with her fifth husband or fifth man or sixth man as the case may be. When there's nothing to draw with, when people are stranded in certain areas of life, when joy is not flowing in that area, what you see is that the life of God will not flow to that area of their life. Yet, in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. You can come into the presence of God and not be able to draw. Because joy is not available. Glory be to Jesus. But the kingdom of God is accessible through those three principal forces, but I want to focus on the force of joy. I just didn't want to deal with it in isolation. That's why I went around and around, but I think somebody understands what I'm talking about right now. Yeah, if you have the foundation of righteousness, you understand the covenant of peace that you have with Jehovah that is supposed to protect your joy. Philippians 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And he said, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, my heart and my mind are the custodians of my joy. Joy comes from my heart. When he says peace will guard my heart, he's saying that that peace is the protector of your joy. When you lose your peace, your joy, you know, evaporates. And I love to, to, to reprimand prayer warriors that are worried. Because it's, uh, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like kingdom. Much prayer should lead to much peace and much joy. Can I say that one more time? Much prayer should lead to much peace and much joy. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer, supplication, uh, 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 with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And what happens next? And the peace of God. That means much prayer should lead to much peace. And much peace guarantees <laughs> fullness of joy. Are you still with me today? Yeah. Much peace guarantees fullness of joy. By the way, joy is a diminishing asset. Yeah, it's a diminishing asset. 
it means that it can evaporate. It's a diminishing asset. Joel chapter 1 verse 12. Put it up for me. Joy is a diminishing asset. I'm going to go through uh, a few things you should know about joy. Joel 1 and verse 12, it says, The vine has dried up, and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, and the palm tree also, and the apple tree. <laughs> These are all the indices of productivity. Yeah. Instead of pomegranates, all those things, put what you are selling. Put your, your work. You understand what I'm saying? Because this agrarian age, he was talking about people, uh, to people who plant stuff. Said all the trees of the field are withered. Surely, joy has withered away from the sons of men. So you can look at it from this point of view. The things around me, I put them in different buckets. My family, my job, my investments. Especially these days where investments are evaporating. Because some people are putting money when they're not supposed to put it. Because of Ojugokoro. Yeah. Uh, what do you call that in English? Help me. <laughs> God help me today. <laughs> because of, you know, uh, um, greed. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. If we interpret it literally what I said, it means insect in the eye. That is allowing your eyes to see what it's not supposed to see. Yeah. It's It's greed. Making people put, put money in places where they're not supposed to put it. So when you put your life in different compartments, your children, your spouse, your investment, your job, your business, your standard family, the health of your body, and you look at all those buckets all around you, in Joel chapter 1 and verse 12, what the scripture says there is that all those things withered, and the prophet looked at it and he said, all those things withered because of one reason. Surely, joy had withered from the heart of men. It means that the things around me respond to the measure of joy in my heart. Are you still with me today? They respond to the measure of joy in my heart. They respond, they respond, they respond. The devil even knows that if I can lose my joy about my marriage, that marriage will start to go down. Yeah, it will start to go down. There will be no excitement in that marriage again. Yeah, I will be complaining more often than rejoicing. When was the last time you said, thank you, Jesus, for my marriage? Yeah. So when, when I complain more often, you know, some people here, you have a job, and you have forgotten that some people don't have. Somebody has graduated two, three years now. They have been looking for a job. You have one. But when was the last time you said, thank you, Lord, for this job? Even though I've been on the same salary for two years, but I say thank you. Even though my boss, his face is like the face of the lion of the tribe of their village. But I, 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 I'm still grateful for this job. Because that's the only way you guarantee that there's joy flowing to that job. Yeah, It's not because things are bad that you are sad. It's because you are sad that things are bad. Yeah. Because sadness, lack of joy, can sap the life of God away from all the things that God has put around you. Yeah. That's what the prophet Joel was saying there. They look at all the indices around somebody's life. The pomegranate tree, the, this one, the palm tree. How can all the tree dry up at the same time? He said, surely, joy has disappeared from the heart of whoever is around this thing. Yeah. Because all these things are connected to the operation of joy in the heart of the custodian. So if you are the custodian of a home, the custodian of a business, you must understand that it responds. I mean, pastors, hear me. The, the level of the joy of a pastor can dry up a church. Yeah. When the pastor comes to church and is always morose, Everybody shouting during praise worship is pastor that is dampening the excitement of other people because the pastor is not, is not rejoicing. Yeah. I mean, when you go to some big churches, <laughs> you see, have you seen Dr. Yedipo dance before in church? It's contagious. Yeah. See, see, uh, Dynamics pastor. He has leg work. Yeah. And he'll be doing it in church. 
I mean, not all of us have moves like that, you understand? I mean, Pastor Lan and I were more bizarre. Yeah. I share everything. If Pastor Lan do leg work, this touch, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> Even you, you'll be, ah, you say, eh, this, this one is new wine, no? new wine. <laughs> you'll be, So I'm saying that people have different personalities. But even within the ambit of my personality, there's an expression of joy that is expected. Yeah. So this one that your spouse is always whining you. And I, I, where are you? Where are you? Even if you are a melancholy, at least you have teeth. Show it. Yeah. You don't have to laugh and be hilarious like a sanguine, but at least show, show that God has been good. Let the joy of the Lord flow from your heart into the life of your children. Let it flow into your business. Let it flow into your marriage. Yeah. Let it flow into everything that God has placed in your hand. That's what we're talking about today. That's what we're talking about. Because some people, they, they, treat, they treat it as if the angel will charge money. If you use this joy too much another thing you should know about joy is that the more you display the more you get yeah. the more you display the more you get the more you display the more the heavens open over your life yeah the more you display the more the heavens open over your life so so if you are hearing me i've said that joy is a force of the kingdom the force of the Holy Spirit at work in the heart of a human, or, or in, in the heart of every human being that is connected to, to God. But I wish we handle our joy, like I just showed you now. Understanding that joy is a diminishing asset, we have to top it up from time to time. Yeah. But one of the things, uh, let, let me tell you, maybe two or three things that the devil tries to do around our joy. Understanding that everything is connected to it. The devil tries to do certain things just to give us a wrong understanding and limit the expression of joy in our lives. Let me share a few. One, some people, uh, how do I put it? Open up to this lie that it's better that you continue to postpone your joy. Because you think there's a, there's a better season coming where you should unleash it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You see somebody, a, a lady, you know, maybe in her 30s or something. She's not always joyful and all that. You say, eh, so what's going on? Why, you know? Say, ah, no, don't worry. When the brother comes, you will see who I am. Yeah. You will see, I, I will show my full glory and my joy. So you are postponing your joy and the expression of life uh, and how you want to present to the kingdom of God until you get married. Yeah. Somebody is waiting for a child. Yeah. And you think it's when you get the child that you will now be experiencing fullness of joy. <laughs> and what people don't know is that it's a gimmick of the devil to postpone and lock people up in expired seasons of life. Yeah. Every season has an expiry date. In natural things, you know, the Bible says in Romans 1 and verse 20, that through the things that can see, the visible attributes, the invisible attributes of God can be understood so that we are left without excuse. Yeah. In natural things, in, in Western world, they are in winter right now. From winter, when we get to around March, April, they are going to spring. They're going to have spring break, for instance, maybe before Easter. Yeah. And then summer will come. Yeah. And then by the time we're in September, towards October, autumn. And then winter will be back again. Every season has an expiry date in the natural. It presupposes that in the things that are not natural, in the things of the spirit, seasons also expire. But when I refuse to operate the forces of the spirit and the principal force for that matter is joy in the season that i am i can be locked up in that season that was why the journey of 40 days 
took Israel 40 years because they, 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 they locked up their, they allowed the devil to repress their joy. They had one thing or the other to complain about all the time. Yeah. How can people who had been in slavery for over 400 years be set free and their major preoccupation will be food, complaining about food? Shouldn't you be grateful for the one who took you out of the tyranny of Egypt? Yeah. And you tell yourself, for the next 40 years, we're not even going to complain about anything. What you have done for us, what we have seen, we saw the Red Sea parted. We saw our oppressor die in the Red Sea. And then we passed through the Red Sea. We just finished the Red Sea. And we now say, manna is not good enough. Ah, give us uh, cucumber. Give us garlic. You know, you even think, I don't know, maybe there's no good food that does it. You think they will mention burger, you know, or the fried rice. They're not even, it's cucumber and garlic. That's what they're looking for. <laughs> and that's how some people operate. Rather than allowing God to take you through a season, the Bible says it gives me a song in the midnight hour. So even in the midnight hour, there's something good about I can sing. Because midnight speaks to a time where everything is dark and gloomy. But if I choose to sing, like Paul and Silas, they sang praises to God even in the prison. And what happened? The prison time expired. According to the order of heaven. How do you fast track your season? Engage vital kingdom forces within the season that you have. Notwithstanding any season of life that you are in right now, maybe you are in a season of waiting. You are waiting for something. While you wait, let the force of joy reverberate around your life. It can fast track a season. People are only locked up in a season when they, they refuse to engage certain forces for that season. And they keep delaying. You know, keep delaying. When this happens, then you will see my true color. Show us your true color. Now. Yeah. Show it now. Show it now. Show it now. Show it now. That's what I'm saying. Stop allowing the devil to cause you to delay your joy. Yeah. And some people think that joy is something that you really have to wait for. You don't have to wait for it. Because I've come to announce to somebody here today that you really have not lost your joy. Yeah. How do I know? It's God that gives joy by his spirit. The devil will create occasions for you to let go of it, but the devil can't take it. Yeah. What he didn't have the power to give. Yeah. He only does things that will make you submit it. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. How can somebody come and collect something? I mean, this person, I mean now, the paper is holding is his own. You understand what I'm saying? For me to collect this paper from him, I have to explain all kinds of things. Imagine that that paper or the issues are my own. I now wore it here today. I'll just say, okay, give me my shoe. I want to collect it. it now. And he will give me because it's my own. But these shoes, they are his own. If I want it, I will have to sit down beside him. In fact, maybe sit on the floor beside him and now be saying, hey, Pastor, you know, <laughs> you know, we've been friends for long. You know, how, I mean, I, I was his best man when he got married. You know, I, you know, I will now be reminding him, you know, I, I was your best man. I've loved you for long. This is true. You have to give me. Yeah, you know, and all that. So we'll now be talking and talking. <laughs> you know, we'll now be talking and talking and all that. So it's not easy for the devil to take your joy. He only does things that make you submit it. Yeah. And it's your prerogative and your choice if you want to submit it or you allow the peace of God to guard your joy. Are you still with me today? Yeah. Can you hear me tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, say, I still have joy. Say, I still have joy. Say, this joy that I have the devil didn't give it to me. The devil can't take it away from me. Somebody shout, I still have joy. Hallelujah. I still have joy.
when you get a sack letter, that was the devil negotiating your joy. But if you have it in front of you and you can shout, I see that joy. When you get a doctor's report, it's not about your body. It's not about an organ in your body. It's about the devil trying to steal your joy. Yeah. It's about the devil trying to steal your joy. And when you get that doctor's report and you put it on the table, and you can look at it, and instead of breaking down and saying, why is my own like this? Who did I offend? Who did we offend in this family? You know, sir? <laughs> look at it and say, I still have joy. I refuse to negotiate my joy. I still have a devil. You didn't give me, you can't take it away. Yeah. And this situation is not powerful enough to take it away from me. Glory be to Jesus. When the Bible says in Matthew 11 and verse 12 that since the day of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has suffered violence, has been forcefully advancing, and the force were pressing it. That's how the force will press in. We press in by refusing to negotiate with the devil. You see, we're made today. We're pressing by, by, by protecting the forces of the kingdom within us. And the, uh, and the principal one is our job. Glory be to Jesus. Also, I need to emphasize this, that from time to time, you need to be able to locate where the devil wants to strike to diminish your joy. Let me explain what I mean. And this, I believe, will set somebody free. Sometimes we we'll create excuses for ourselves to submit our joy. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I just got married, we had a lot of struggles. I used to feel like maybe I shouldn't have married my wife. I'm just being vulnerable with you. Yeah. And I'm not alone. I know many people here. It's called buyer's remorse. When you buy something, sometimes you buy a car, you drive it home. The next morning, you go out and you now look at the car. I tell yourself, ha. Uh, but this is on that. But they were also selling Toyota there. Why didn't I even buy Toyota? This one said, the tire is small. There's one that's tire is bigger. You know, you now be, I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's called buyer's remorse. Yeah. You would think that somebody should change you by giving you this one. It happens when we get a job, when it's sometimes even when we, you buy a house or you move into another house, you'll be reminding yourself, but there's one four bedroom that you showed us. And the same price with this one. This is now three bedroom. This one does not even have the kitchen is small. Why did I even take this one? By the time you call them, say that one has been taken. For the next three days, you may not be happy about this house. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, you just you just be wondering. So what, what is this coconut head? What happened? Why did I make this choice? You understand what I'm saying? When you get into that kind of situation, the devil is looking for a way to steal your joy. When your spouse has wronged you and the thing breaks your heart tell yourself i'm not going to let go of my joy yeah you have to not note that the devil is trying to come in through that way yeah and i'm not going to submit it you know why we submit most of the time we lie to romance pain we feel that we have the right to our pain this person wronged me i must be it, it's painful and I must feel it. I must feel that pain. Yeah. And I must report him to everybody that can hear. Or report that to anybody that can hear. So you have reported to five people now. And instead of your joy going up, it continues to go down. Yeah. So what are you really doing? Yeah. Because you keep reporting. And you keep losing your joy. In fact, you report to some people. They even say, pack out. Pack out. What is it, Seth? People who are not married are living in this world. You know. I can, I can somebody be, be, be treating you like that. Move out. Move out. No, 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 no. And you two, you are contemplating. You go to your wardrobe, you move some clothes. You now go and sit down in the room and be thinking about it again. And be shaking leg. You know how they shake leg. <laughs> I, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. At that point, please recognize that the devil is negotiating your joy. Anytime you feel you have a right to be sad about something, you just lost a negotiation. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just feel like I have a right 
Yeah, I have it. You know, Jesus said, I mean, the scripture says, be angry, but sin not. Yeah. You have a right to your anger. But when it starts to take your joy away, your right has been taken too far. You have to reverse. Yeah. You have to reverse. You have to reverse. You have a right to be angry with somebody, but by the time you start cursing them and, and, and abusing their father and their mother, Jesus said you have crossed the I mean, the scripture says you have crossed the boundary. Yeah. And then you have opened up to the devil. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Very important. As you check your rights, your right to be angry, your right to feel pain, please watch it. Because what our rights, when taken too far, offer us is that it opens the door to the spirit of heaviness. Yeah, it opens the door to the spirit of heaviness. That's what it does. It opens the door to the spirit of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness is a sinker. That's what I'm going to close on today. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 from verse 1. Can you put it up for me? Isaiah 61 from verse 1. The spirit of heaviness. We're going to deal with it right here. Before I close. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of prison to those who are bound. Verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Look at this. Look at this. The B part there. Said to comfort all who mourn in Zion. Verse 3. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them what? Beauty for ashes. And again what? The oil of joy for mourning. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. Can you see righteousness there again? <laughs> yeah, you see righteousness there again. So that it may be called when the oil of joy is in you. Your name is tree of righteousness. Because that's the foundation of everything. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. But this is where I'm going. Here, the prophet Isaiah, this is a messianic prophecy. Talking about Jesus and in Luke 4, 18, Jesus read this scripture out to say, this is, this, I'm, I'm the one that they're talking about there. Isaiah said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Yeah, I'm the one they're talking about. I'm the one that brings joy, that brings peace, that brings righteousness. Now, this is where I'm going. The opposite of joy in English is sadness. Am I saying the truth? In the things of the spirit, the opposite of joy is the spirit of heaviness. Yeah. The opposite of joy is heaviness. Heaviness is the mother of depression. Heaviness is the mother of panic attack. Heaviness <laughs> is the mother, is the one that gives back to what they call psychosomatic illnesses. These are illnesses that has no pathological basis. How do I mean? Uh, for people to be sick and they cannot find scientifically or through viruses and germs what went wrong there's no infection there's nothing you know you know it's possible for somebody to have <laughs> even as bad as uh, uh, things like i mean if i want to stretch it things like skin disease <laughs> and then they will test it and there's no virus no germ it is just the fact that your your, your joy has dried up that skin is drying up <laughs> I don't know if you get what I'm saying. It is the spirit of heaviness that is the mother of all those things that I've mentioned. It is the opposite of joy. Yeah. Heaviness is a sinker. When you say something is heavy, it cooperates with the law of gravity to hold people down on head. You can imagine, let me paint a picture to you. Somebody that has like a 50 kg load hung on his neck and thrown into the water what will happen to the person 
be sent down. That's the operation of the spirit of heaviness. The moment you allow it, everything starts to go down. Yeah, it starts to go down. People struggle for life when they are under the operations of the spirit of heaviness. They cannot see joy anywhere. They cannot see anything that is working. They are drowning because of the spirit of heaviness. Heaviness is a sinker. It sinks people's mood. It sinks their mind so that they will not be able to think straight and steals people's joy completely. And to enjoy the provision of the covenant, health, peace, joy, wealth, love, safety, and everything, you need to yank off the spirit of heaviness from your life. Yeah. And that's why we encourage that you live a life of gratitude. Yeah. Live a life of gratitude. Let the people praise you, oh God, let the people praise you. So then the heart will yield that increase. The Lord our God will bless us. You can go on and on and on. You know, just a life of thanksgiving, gratitude. Revelation 12 and 11 says we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Some people here, you have not shared one testimony this year. Sometimes it is heaviness that is closing your mouth. Don't just say, I'm not just a type. I'm not a type that shares testimonies. Even if you don't want to come on the altar, share it in your small group. Share it with your friends. Don't use your body to cover everything that God is doing in your life. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. When you do that, you are enabling and opening the door to heaviness because very soon, you'll start second-guessing that testimony as if it's nothing. Yeah. As if it's nothing. As if it's nothing. The operations of the spirit of heaviness in the life of a believer will deny the believer all the benefits. Yeah. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, there may not be fruit in the vine, the labor of the olive may fail. That's what the scripture says there. Habakkuk 3 and 17. Labor of the olive may fail and all that. He said, but yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. What it means is that I will not allow the operation of the spirit of heaviness around my life. I will not, because I know that I'm supposed to transmit life from within to things around me, if they are going down, they will not diminish my life and my joy. I will counteract it by transmitting life and joy to them. Yeah. That's why I said, though the fig tree may not blossom, there may not be fruit in the vine, Everything, all the indices of success may be going down, but yet I will rejoice. I will rejoice because if I rejoice, I'm able to transmit from my within into what is going down and what is going down will start to go up. Let me just add one or two things to this and I'll close. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 6 and you put it up for me. One of the ways also that we deal with the spirit of heaviness, First Timothy 6 and verse 6, quickly, verse 6, verse 6, is to refuse all right, verse 6 says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Yeah. Look, give me verse 7. Verse 7, quickly. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing. Then verse 8 says, then, and having food and clothing with which, with, <laughs> with these, we shall be what? What did he say? Can you say it one more time? Say it one more time. Now, I need to show somebody something here that will help you to deal with the spirit of heaviness. There's something I call inspirational dissatisfaction. Many people mismanage their dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction with what's going on around you will lead to complaints. And when complaints abound, you are opening the door to the spirit of heaviness. That's how come Christians can be depressed. Ordinarily, Christians should not, you can't be seated with Christ in heavenly place and be depressed. Yeah. But when you open the door and submit your joy, depression will come in. And the depression comes from the spirit of heaviness. That's why you can pray for people and the spirit of heaviness will depart. I'm going to pray right now. The spirit of heaviness will depart. And even people who are going to therapy already will not need therapy again. Yeah. Because the spirit of heaviness has departed. That thing that is hanging on people's neck. Jesus said, 
Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Matthew 11, verse 28, you know, down to 30. He said, take my yoke upon you. You need, if you need any yoke at all, you need something on your neck, take this one. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ah! My yoke is easy, verse 30, and my burden is light. Many people are carrying the yoke of the devil rather than taking up on you the yoke of Christ, which is easy. His burden is light. So, back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 that I was talking about. When you are dissatisfied with anything, make it inspirational. Don't allow it to bring depression into your life. I don't like where I am, but I'm going to enjoy where I am on the way to where I'm going. That is what I call inspirational dissatisfaction. I don't like how things are around my home right now, but yet I will enjoy the wife of my youth while we both gain wisdom to move this thing forward. Our focus must always be on moving forward, moving forward, not going back. I hope you understand what I'm saying. He said, having food and raiment with this, we shall be content. Not contained, but content. When you feel contained where you are, what happens is that you start to invite the spirit of heaviness. Contentment is different from containment. I am content, but I refuse to be contained. I enjoy where I am on the way to where I'm going. I am content with where I am, but I'm not contained where I am. And as I keep saying that to myself, God starts to show me the way forward. Yeah. God starts to show me the way forward. Lastly today, Hebrews 12 and verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, quickly. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. For the joy that was set before him, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's a joy that is set before you. Yeah. Rather than postponing your joy, look at the joy that was set before you. So when I think about the day where some things will happen in my life. That's why I love Pastor Nathaniel's new song. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we're waiting for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. You know that joy, that, that song, you know what it does to me? It empowers you to borrow joy from the future into the present. Jesus, in a moment, hung on the cross. The Bible says he despised the shame. Somebody listen to me right now as we pray. I need you to understand your situation may be like you are on the cross. <laughs> on a marital cross. On a career cross. Somebody's nailing you. But the Bible says for the joy that was set before him. When you refuse to be contained on the cross, but you can see the joy that is ahead of you, you borrow joy from the future into the present. You are permitted in the things of the Spirit to borrow joy from your future and bring it to your present. Yeah, to so think about it, your wedding day and in the morning at 6 a.m. while you are preparing for work, you do your wedding day dance, you know, that morning. Because you borrow joy from the future. Because you believe that future is sealed in the blood of Jesus and it's going to happen. So you borrow joy from there into the present. So that you will not be contained in the present, but you will be content in the present. <laughs> Are you still with me today? Rise on your feet, everyone. Rise on your feet, everyone. That's how we live. Yeah. For the joy that is set before me. I will endure the cross. I will despise the shame. Lift your two hands to Jesus. We we'll sing that song once or twice.